if you're new with us today, uh, we are celebrating our seventh birthday as a church, which is incredible. So can we celebrate that again, y'all? That's awesome, an amazing thing. Incredible to see seven years of God doing some awesome things to us. So before we get started, I want to honor a few groups of people. First off, if you were on our launch team, which meant you were with us when all we had was a dream, we didn't even have a location, like stand up real quick. If you were our original launch team, we got Jason in the back, we got Mark and Carrie, we got Allison, my bride, Jennifer Bullock. Can we celebrate these folks? Thank you, thank you. Y'all stay standing for just a moment. The second group is you were with us at the Johnston Community College days. Like you did portable church. You dealt with portable church in freezing cold, in sweltering heat, but you were with us at JCC. Would you stand up if you were with us at Johnston Community College? Got some folks that went through that with us. Can we celebrate these folks? Thank you for your longevity and your consistency. And last but not least, if you serve in any way, shape, or form here, you're a volunteer, can you stand up for just a moment? Can we honor those who serve so faithfully? Stand up, all volunteers. That includes volunteer staff. Thank y'all for your service and all y'all do. Thank y'all. Y'all have a seat. Thank y'all. Thank y'all. And then last but not least, uh, when we started, we always said we wanted to be a church that didn't just start a church, but a church that started churches and so we've got some special guests in the house, which is Pastor Sean and his launch team from Township. Y'all stand up real quick. We celebrate y'all. We honor y'all, y'all's faithfulness, y'all's courage, y'all's risk-taking. And we believe that, man, the best is yet to come for y'all and that y'all will be just the first of many that we send. And my prayer is that you'll be able to look back seven years from now and see God do some awesome things. So we can celebrate y'all. Y'all have a seat. Thank y'all, thank y'all, thank y'all this morning. Well, if you are new with us, man, what I want you to know about our church is that the reason we started LifeSpring and the reason we started Townships and a team to start Township is because we believe that the single most important thing in the world, something we give our very lives to, is to give everyone opportunities to follow Jesus. And the reason that's important is not because following Jesus is a religion you add to your life, but because we believe that following Je Jesus means that you actually find life because he's the very source of life. That's why we exist. That's why we sent a team to start another church because we believe that everything comes back to following Jesus. And we believe that based on two statements that define the very foundation of our faith. And if you're not from a church background or maybe you're back in church for the first time in a long time, the truth is these two statements that our faith rests on can tend to sound kind of crazy. And if you did grow up in church, maybe you are from a church background, you've been in church a long time, then it's often very easy to take for granted how crazy these two statements that we're going to look at today are. And if you're not from a church background, it's going to be very easy when you hear both of these ideas to say, that's ridiculous. Because our default reaction when we hear something that sounds unbelievable is very simply to not believe it. For example, I learned this last Sunday. One of my boys, he's about three and a half, so he goes to our pre-K room for Life Kids. And I go to pick him up, and his teacher says, hey, he's holding on to this little yellow train. There's a picture of it on the screen, and he actually brought it with, let me have it today. He's holding on to this very, very tightly. And his teacher said, he's saying this is a home train. And I'm like, Kason, there's no way. This is a church train. It belongs here. And we had to like use vice scripts to like pry it out of his fingers and he made a fuss about it and I was like, it's okay, it's not your train. Well, he wouldn't let it go. And later on that afternoon, it's just me and him in the house. He's like, I want my train back from church. And I was like, Kason, it's not your train, it's a church train. And then he said, well, that's a bad church because they stole my train. <laughs> And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. That, that, like, that's not okay. 
But then I got to thinking about it. And the truth about my preschooler is he's unbelievably honest. So I was like, okay, let me go back and do some digging. And so I'm looking at some old pictures of his that we took at the house. And lo and behold, on our living room floor, he's playing with that right there. There is nothing that's more humiliating than having to apologize to your preschooler because they got something right that you got wrong. But I did, and originally he wasn't going to let me bring this as of last night, but when my wife brought in this morning, he said this would make me happy, so he allowed me to bring it to church, and I promised to give it back. What is the point of all that? Just because something sounds unbelievable... Just because something sounds a little crazy. Just because something sounds like there's no way that could ever possibly happen doesn't mean that it's actually not true. And so if you're here today, you're not from a church background. You've got questions about Jesus. You've got questions about Christianity. I'm going to bring up these two statements and they are going to sound a little crazy. But what I want to encourage you to think about this morning, whether you're here in the room or whether you're watching online, is what if these two statements are actually true? Because if they are, they have eternal implications. So let's take a, a, look, a look at them. The two statements on which our faith as Christians rests. Statement number one is this. Jesus is the only way to God. Now, here's what I know in our culture. That's a controversial statement. Because our culture as a whole and even a large percentage of people who say they're Christians subscribe to what I would call Google Map theology. You might say, what is Google Map theology? I'm glad you asked. And let me go on record first off saying this. I love Google Maps. You might say, why do you love Google Maps? Well, because I'm young enough to remember what road trips were like with my parents without Google Maps. Some of y'all are old enough to remember what driving was like without Google Maps because you had about a six foot wide map that you needed a microscope to read and traveling down major highways was okay, but once you got to like the nitty gritty to get to your destination, it was just conflict. Because you got the passenger trying to read the map, you've got the driver trying to interpret it, and it just did not go well. Who remembers those days? We can all be thankful they no longer exist. But then we evolved as a species, and we got MapQuest, which was exciting. Because you got more specific directions, but sometimes it would miss large steps. And then we got the old school GPS which was great unless you didn't update it every two weeks. Because then you'd be looking at your map and you're driving on marsh, but you know you're on a road. And then we finally got to Google Maps, and Google Maps is amazing because you have not just directions, you've got options. Like if you're environmentally conscious, you can choose the eco-friendly route. Even if it takes you an hour longer to get there, you can choose the eco-friendly route. If that's you, I respect it, I value you, but I'm more of the guy that likes to get there in a hurry. So I always default to the fast route. If there's a detour you wanna take, you like the scenic route, you can detour and guess what? Google Maps will find you a way back to your route. It will even work you around traffic jams and you can choose let me get away from this 45-minute slowdown. Or I've been praying that God would develop my patience, and so I think I'm just going to stay in it. 
But no matter what option you choose, you end up at the same destination. And that sounds awesome for Google Maps. And it's honestly very comfortable from a theological standpoint because it's not controversial. It doesn't make anybody feel bad. It doesn't cause any discomfort because, hey, you do your thing, I'll do my thing, and we'll all end up in the same place. Even within the church, depending on the study you read, between 60 to 70% of Christians are okay with this type of thinking. It's comfortable. It fits with culture. There's just one glaring problem. Jesus doesn't give us that option. In fact, John 14, 6, y'all follow along with me. He says this, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. Now, now let's stop there for a moment. Jesus didn't say the things I've taught are true. He didn't say following what I say leads to life. He didn't say, I have told you the best way to go. No, he said, I, he himself, is the way personified. He himself is the embodiment of truth. He himself, the person of Jesus, is life itself. This is nothing less than a claim to deity. That he is not just a way, that he is not just an example of truth, that he's not just a way to life, but he is life itself. He is truth itself. He is the way itself. It is nothing less than a claim to deity, which sounds crazy. But then he goes on to say this as well. He says, no one comes to the Father except through me. Google map theology is very attractive. It has a large appeal. But Jesus did not give us that option. Jesus defined his, himself as the only way to God and there is no other. Now you might wonder, well, when his disciples recorded his words, specifically John, who wrote this account of the life of Jesus, did he just misremember? Did he perhaps misunderstand what Jesus was saying? Well, I don't think so, because in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, we see a guy named Peter addressing the very religious leaders who condemned Jesus to die, and it seems like they took Jesus' words really literally. Because Peter says this in Acts 4 verse 12. He says this. He says, salvation is found in who? No one else. If you're watching online, type in the chat, no one else. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Jesus defined himself as the only way to God. Peter, preaching several months after Jesus' death, defined Jesus as the only way to God. But what makes this really unique, specifically Peter preaching it, is that he's preaching this to the religious leaders who had Jesus killed, and that was very unusual for Peter because Peter did not start off quite so bold. In fact, the night that Jesus was arrested, all his disciples ran away from him. They all freaked out. They all chickened out. But Peter kind of stayed at a distance. And we read what happens next in John chapter 18, verse 15. This is the story. 
It says Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. Because this disciple was known to the high priest, he went in with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard, but Peter had to wait outside of the door. The other disciple who was known to the high priest came back, spoke to the servant girl on duty there and brought Peter in. You aren't one of this man's disciples too, are you? She asked Peter. He replied, watch this, I'm not. Lied about it. It was cold and the servants and officials stood around a fire they had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing with them warming himself. And then you move to verse 25, it says, Meanwhile, Simon Peter was still standing there warming himself. So they asked him, You aren't one of his disciples too, are you? He denied it, saying, I'm not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man, watch this, whose ear Peter had cut off. She so said, what's going on there? Well, when the soldiers first came to arrest Jesus, Peter decided to try to be bold, chopped off a guy's ear, and Jesus is like, cut it out. And now he's got this guy's friend or relative or buddy saying, hey, you were there, weren't you? And then watch what it says next. Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, a rooster began to crow. And in Luke's account of the life of Jesus, he records that Peter wept outside and went outside and wept bitterly. Why? Because Peter was a coward. Concerned primarily about saving his own skin. And it didn't get any better a couple of days later. John chapter 20, verse 19 records this. <clears throat> that on the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, watch this, <clears throat> with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. In other words, Peter and all the disciples were so scared after Jesus' crucifixion that they were convinced they were next. They were freaked out. They were scared. And yet, just a couple of months later, we see Peter, this exact same guy, preaching to the very religious leaders who had Jesus condemned to die, saying Jesus is the only way. What accounts for that switch? What moves somebody from fearful to unwaveringly courageous? Well, think about this. If you enter a dark room and you're scared of the dark, how many of y'all were scared of the dark as kids? Come on, we can be honest. We can be honest. I was scared. You were scared. We were all scared. When you flip the light on and you can see more than you could before, the fear goes away. If you felt lonely and were scared to be by yourself, the presence of another person took you from fearful to courageous. And if you were facing something or someone that was way too big for you, and somebody bigger than you and stronger than you came alongside of you, all of a sudden you were able to move forward and face the thing you were facing because there was somebody else with you. The point of all that is this. We do not naturally go from scared to fearless. Something has to happen to cause a switch to flip. So what took these guys from so scared of the consequences of following Jesus that Peter even denied it to a little servant girl and all the disciples locked themselves in a room because they were scared they were going to be next. What explains the switch? What explains the switch stems from something we won't read right yet. We'll just summarize. Earlier on the first day of the week, some of the women who were following Jesus show up to the disciples and they're like, hey, we've got awesome news. We went to the tomb to put spices on Jesus' body. But when we got there, the stone was rolled away. 
and the tomb was empty and Jesus was not there and there were angels there that said, he's not here, he's risen. And then guess what? One of us, Mary Magdalene, actually saw Jesus and talked to him. But the writers of the Gospels, the written accounts of the life of Jesus, say that the way the disciples responded were, that's a bunch of nonsense. Because people do not come back from the dead. And yet in the second part of John chapter 20, verse 19, this is what we see happen. It says, while they were in their room with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. In other words, this wasn't a hallucination. This wasn't a dream. This wasn't something they just wished would happen and then they all of a sudden had a vision of Jesus. They touched him. They ate with him. They spent time with him. And over 40 days, there were multiple times where they sat down with Jesus after he came back to life and then 50 days after Jesus' resurrection. We see the first message ever preached on the birthday of the church. And watch what is at the core of their message. In Acts chapter 2, it's recorded like this. Starting in verse 22, this is Peter again. Scared Peter. Cowardly Peter. But he says, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Then verse 32, Peter says, God has raised this Jesus to life and we are all witnesses of it. Which leads me to the second crazy statement that our faith rests on, and it's this. Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus rose from the dead. In fact, Paul, writing to the Corinthians, went as far to say that if Jesus didn't come back to life, our preaching is useless, and so is our faith. Without the resurrection, we've got nothing but because of the resurrection, we've got everything. Because the way they knew that Jesus was being truthful when he said he was the only way is because he proved it when he came back to God. And because of that, they had the courage to make this statement in Acts 2, verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and and Messiah. That's the core of the message. That Jesus came back to life. And you might say, that sounds crazy, and it does. Because people don't come back to life. But what makes the most sense, logically speaking? How do you have guys go from fearful, scared, spitless, to speaking to the very crowd that cheered for Jesus to be crucified in less than two months. Because this is like a whole different level of WWE smack talk, right? Like, hey, by the way, y'all crucified this guy. Like y'all did, y'all did, y'all killed him. Guess what? It didn't work because God brought him back to life. What would fuel somebody with that kind of courage? Would it be that they just had sentimentality over Jesus? No. Would it be that they just wanted Jesus' message to keep going? No. They were so scared they had no interest in doing that. And it certainly wouldn't explain why at the end of his life, Peter was crucified upside down because he did not back off the claim that Jesus is the only way and Jesus came back to life. What best explains it? 
Because people might die for something that's not true, but nobody will willingly die for something they know to be a lie. Why in the world would guys like Peter, who was crucified upside down, and James, who was beheaded, and John, who was boiled in oil and then shipped off to Patmos to die in exile, why would they keep saying this if they knew the whole time that Jesus was still dead? And yet they changed from fearful and scared to bold and courageous, even unto death, which leads me to this. The disciples changed lives, proved the credibility of their message. The disciples changed lives, proved the credibility of their message. And you know what else? It is changed lives today that prove the credibility of that message is still for real. Because I could tell you person after person in the seven years We've been doing this as a church of people who have had their lives absolutely changed by Jesus because they came to realize that Jesus is the only way and that he proved it by coming back from the dead. And because of that, they surrendered their lives to him as Lord. Jesus is the only way and his resurrection proved it. And you might hear that and you might say, but Dylan, that sounds intolerant. That sounds exclusive. It kind of sounds like God has created a little box where the perfect people get in if you check all the boxes and do all the right things and it excludes everybody else. And I've just got a problem with that kind of exclusivity because it feels like God is putting a wall between himself and people. And I understand the argument. I understand the pushback. But the truth of the matter is this. God didn't send Jesus to build walls between God and people. He sent Jesus to destroy the wall between God and people. Because John 3, 16 says this, that for God so loved the world, the world. Paul tells Timothy that God is not willing that anybody should perish, but that all come to repentance. God did not want to create a wall between himself and people. He wanted it to be destroyed. And the only way for that to be destroyed was for God to give his one and only son. Why did that have to happen? Because there was a wall between God and people. It's called sin. Sin is not just bad things we do. Sin is the core of who we are from birth. We're born imperfect. We're born with the tendency to do wrong things. We're born sinful, and because of that, we cannot get back to God on our own. We needed somebody to make a way for us. And so God, in his love for the world, sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, to live a perfect, flawless, spotless life in our place and then go to a cross. Why did he have to go to the cross? Because scripture tells us that the penalty for sin is death. And the reason the penalty for sin is death is because when you compare a perfect holy God to even the smallest amount of imperfection, the smallest sin, the smallest white lie, the smallest amount of greed, or lust, or anger, is nothing less than cosmic treason against the perfect holy God. And that earns us death. But even our death won't get us back to God because we die in our sin, we die imperfect. So we needed somebody to wipe away our sin. But only somebody infinite in nature and only somebody infinite in perfection could cancel out our infinite imperfection. 
So God sent his one and only son, fully God, fully man, to live on this earth, live a sinless life, and then go to a cross to die in our place that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life because God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. And it was the only way. And in fact, that is exclusive. But I want you to hear this this morning, that Jesus is the only way, is the only way everyone has a chance to come back to God. Because in any other religious system, you've got to work towards it. You've got to earn it. And there are certain things that completely disqualify you. But through the grace of God, displayed in Jesus, it doesn't matter what your past is. And it doesn't matter what your present is. And it doesn't matter how long you've run from God. And it doesn't matter what you did last night. It doesn't matter what you did last summer. It doesn't matter what you did 30 years ago. Because Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, your sin is paid for and everyone on earth has the opportunity to come back to God and be saved. No other religious system offers that kind of grace. How does it happen? Well, John 3.18 says this, that whoever believes in him And the idea here is putting your trust in him, like sitting in a chair. You put your trust in him. You're not putting your trust in your effort. You're not putting your trust in your work. You're not putting your trust in religion. You're putting your trust in Jesus. I like to put it like this. If I was to die today and step into eternity, and I don't know if this is the way it'll happen because I've never been there, but I imagine if somebody was at the gates of heaven and said, why should you get in? My answer would be this. I don't have a reason. There is nothing that I as a person, even as a pastor, can offer. My only hope is that 2,000 years ago, Jesus got on a cross in my place and he fully paid the sin debt that I owe and then he came back to life and that is my only hope. I can't place it in my works. I can't place it in my good deeds. I can't place it in my profession as a pastor. I can only place it in the finished work of Jesus, and that is my only hope. But Scripture says that whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of of God's one and only Son. There is only one way, and it is through Jesus. So what do we do? Well, I'm going to let Peter give the invitation this morning. Acts chapter 2, this is the conclusion of his message on the birthday of the church. He says this, Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And when the people heard this, They were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children, watch this, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. It is not for the perfect people. And by the way, there's no such thing as a perfect person. It is not for the religious. It is not for the people who seem to have it all together. It is for anyone and everyone who will put their trust in Jesus as the only way to salvation. And so if you're here today and you've never put your trust in Jesus as the only way, the response this morning is this. I'm going to give you the opportunity to do that. And then you need to be baptized. 
today. You might say, I didn't come ready to be baptized today. That's okay because we came ready for you to be baptized today. We've got all the clothes, all the towels, everything needed. And baptism doesn't save you. Baptism is simply an outward demonstration of what Jesus has changed inside of you. It's like a wedding ring. It marks you as a follower of God. So I wanna ask everybody to bow their heads and close their eyes. And with nobody looking around this morning, if you're here today and you would say, Pastor Dylan, I need to give my life to Christ. I've trusted in my efforts, I've trusted in my works, or maybe I've just never really believed in the whole God thing, to be honest, but today I realize I need to give my life to Christ. If that's you this morning, just right where you sit, call out to your heavenly Father and say, God, I'm a sinner, and I realize Jesus is the only way. I believe you sent Jesus to die in my place. And I believe he rose from the dead. And today, Jesus, I give my life to you. I'll go wherever you tell me to go. And I'll do whatever you tell me to do. And I'll do it regardless of the cost. Jesus, today I'm all yours. And I'm all in.